Uh, so welcome everyone. I'm going to start in the same way as Anastasia. I'm sorry that my slides are not in Russian. Uh, the last time I tried to speak in Russian, everybody laughed at me and it was just saying hello. So after that, the only thing that I can do in Russian is buy bottled water. So, <laughs> thanks. Uh, my name is, as you can see, Ivan Trukic. And uh, essentially, my C++ life started as a part of KDE, which is a free software open source project, one of the largest, probably the largest C++ project in the world, open source, obviously. Uh, I also do a lot of talks and I teach at the university. I also wrote a book and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> That's the least important part of, of the presentation, but it's, it's formality, so I, can, I need to go through it. So I always start all of my presentations and all the workshops and everything else with this quote by one of the greatest functional uh, developers, Philip Vadla. Uh, he says, you should make your code readable because I'm going to translate it. <laughs> you could have some insane coworkers, and when they see ugly code that you wrote, then they might kill you. So you should always be considered to yourself and to others and write code that is pretty and readable and easy to understand. So we're going to start with a topic that is near and dear to all of our hearts because we are C++ developers. And those are iterators. Iterators was, are one of the greatest ideas in software development created by Alex Stepanov. The idea is that we want to create an abstraction that allows us to use the same APIs to work on different types of collections. So for example, if we work with uh, normal CRAs, we would use plus plus operators to move the pointer to the next element. There is no reason why we wouldn't be able to do the same, call plus plus for any other collection and to move the abstract pointer to another element. The only problem, the problem in C is that C only has pointers, it doesn't have iterators. So if you want to move from one element in a linked list to another element in a linked list, you can't use the same API. So you can't use the operator plus plus. But in C++, thanks to Stepanov, we can do all the great things that you would be able to do with normal CRAs with the simple API for pointers. We can do the same things on all other collections like maps, like hash, well, hash maps, sets, and linked lists, and everything else. So, Let's see a simple example. Uh, we can have a list of identifiers and we want, well, yeah, a list of tokens, and we want just to extract the valid identifiers. We can simply just say copy if, predicate to use with the copy if will return true if the token is valid and it will return false if it's not. We just need to traverse the whole collection and that's, that's it. Now the question is, the tokens collection, do we know what type it is? Is it a vector? Is it a list? Is it a set? We don't care. We just want the algorithm to go through all the items, whatever the underlying structure is, and collect all the correct ones. Now, the first two iterators can be normal iterators. If it's a std vector, it could be a pointer. Begin and end could be pointers. But the, the third one, back inserter, usually pointers should point to a place in memory. Does back inserter point to any place? No, it's an abstraction. It's an abstraction that doesn't even behave like a normal pointer. In the case of a normal pointer, we would get, in the best case scenario, we would get a segmentation fault here because we are trying to write to an empty collection. But the iterator abstraction is powerful enough to redefine what plus plus means, but also what dereferencing mean. In this case, dereferencing and trying to store a value on the thing that is pointed to by the iterator means pushback. So again, it's a really nice abstraction. We can use the same algorithm 
with normal collections or with special iterators. Okay, so we can replace the first two iterators with something that is not even a collection. Obviously, the syntax a little bit changed because it's not called begin and end anymore. But if you consider a linked list to be a collection, it's an item and the rest of the list. We can also consider the input stream to be a collection. If the user puts a lot of integers on the input, it's a collection of those integers. So why wouldn't we be able to read the standard input as if it were a normal collection? And again, thanks to iterators, we can simply by using even smarter iterators than back inserter, that's called input stream iterator. Now, one of my favorite algorithms and my favorite examples, imagine you have a user interface with some items selected, some items deselected, and you, are, you want to allow the user to drag and drop and to drop all the items to a specific place. Now, often people ignore the standard library because apart from std sort, none of the algorithms are useful. A lot of people think so. But this is something that almost any GUI application has. And this is just moving all the selected items from the bottom, uh, from the top part of the, select, uh, of the list to the destination pointer. And checking out just the bottom part, we are going to move all the selected items to the start. And this is just two stable partitions. So the first stable partition to move all the non-selected items to the end of the first segment, and then the second stable partition to move all the selected items to the start of the second segment. So a really trivial thing, but most of the people when they see stable partition, okay, I know it's used in quick sort, but I already have std sort, so I'll never, I'm never going to use a stable partition. But the algorithm is really, really awesome and really apl applicable in a lot of situations. Now, although iterators are really awesome, and you should all use iterators as much as you can, they have a few problems. So all algorithms uh, take pairs of iterators, and you can't easily compose different algorithms in, the, in a normal way. So we could, we could have used, uh, in the previous example, we used two stable partitions to achieve a goal. So it's kind of a composition, but it's not a composition in a normal sense of composing two functions. Just imagine uh, you want to do a sum of squares of a, of a collection, which is something that is often done in uh, numerics. This should be separately into two different uh, actions. One action is transforming the collection, so squaring all the values in a collection, and the second one should be accumulate to sum the collection. And if you use the standard library, we would end up with something like this, which is definitely not optimal. If you wrote a normal for loop, we could do it efficiently without uh, allocating a whole new vector of values. Now, because the standard library alg algorithms take iterators, and obviously the sum of squares is a really, really, really uh, common thing to do, the standard library has an algorithm called transform reduce. If we can't have, if we can't compose transform and accumulate, we're going to create another algorithm that is called transform accumulate, but we're not going to call it accumulate because this is parallel and we're going to call it transform reduce. And the worst part is that before this, alg before this algorithm became parallelized, it was called inner product. So just imagine having an algorithm in the standard library called inner product. You're definitely never going to use it. But transform reduce kind of sounds cool. It's like map reduce and big data and stuff. So this guy might actually be called once in a while. So the problem, apart from all the mistakes that you can make with iterators, the main problem is the pairs. Each algorithm can return a single value at most. 
and all algorithms get pairs of something. So you can't really pass a result of one, uh, one algorithm to another if you don't want to create an intermediary vector. So we could be really smart, like a lot of people did, including some people from Boost. Uh, we can create smart, beautiful proxy iterators. So instead of having an actual result collection to store our all transformed values, we can create a proxy iterator which stores a real iterator underneath as a private member, and we can create, uh, create it so that it remembers a transformation function that it needs to apply. So in the, the reference operator for the iterator, we don't really have the data, but we have the transformation function, we have the iterator to underlying collection, and we can easily, on the, the referencing, we can just transform the value and pretend that we re returned a value from a collection. Just like eStream iterators pretend they read the value from memory, in the same way we can pretend and just call transform on a real value. And this is the approach that would optimize our previous solution with STD Accumulate. We would just pass the smart proxy iterator instead of passing uh, the iterator to a pre-calculated -pre vector. So that's the first part of the solution. We still have the problem of pairs. So instead of having pairs, we are just going to create something that's called a range. And it's going to have an iterator inside for the beginning of the sequence or the range. And we are going to have something called Sentinel to denote the end of the range. Now, algorithms in the standard library use the same type of iterators for both begin and end. But uh, in recent years, we got a range-based for loop, which doesn't force you for begin and end to be of the same type. Do you know what the reason behind that change? Is there a single collection that should have a different type for begin and end? So semantically, the end iterator is something that you never dereference. If you dereference it, it's seg fault in the best case, right? You never move it. Why, why then is it an iterator? Why it should be an iterator? It only, is, it only serves to be compared with a proper iterator to check whether we, we reached the end. So there is no reason why end iterator should have a plus plus or the referencing operator. And in some cases like C strings, which are terminated by, by zero, do we know in advance which is what is going to be the end of the string? We can evaluate it, we can pass through the whole string and return the end in O of N. But we don't need to. For most algorithms that just pass through, through a collection, that would mean passing through the collection twice, once to get the end iterator, and the second time to actually perform the operation. In some collections, you can't pass the collection twice. For example, for input streams. If you tried to get the end of the input stream, it means that you already read and forgot all the values. So in some cases, you can't even pass a collection twice. So Instead of the end being a proper iterator, it just needs to be some dummy, some sentinel which is able to tell us are we at the end or not. Okay. So that's the reason why ranges don't have pairs of iterators, but a pair of one iterator and one sentinel. And since the iterator inside of the range can be, can be the smart proxy iterator like we saw for the transform, then we can have code that looks something like this. So we have axes, we transform each axis by squaring it, and then accumulate the results. Now we have a properly composable set of functions. If we wanted, we could add a filter. We could add as many of the smart proxy transformations as we want. Now, this syntax is a little bit awkward for most non-functional oriented people because 
this is written from right to left. We, transform, we filter axes, then transform the result, then accumulate the result, which is a little bit contrary to the usual object-oriented notation. Uh, the ranges library supports the pipe syntax, and the pipe syntax looks like the usual Unix shell syntax. So we have axes, pipe them through the transformation, pipe them through filtering, and accumulate the result. Now, accumulate doesn't have the pipe accumulate, because accumulate returns a single value and it evaluates everything. And all of the others just transform and return a new range. So, one of my favorite examples to show when talking about ranges was uh, Donald Knut, uh, Knut's example of uh, counting frequencies, calculating frequencies of words. So, for the ACM journal, Knuth was asked to implement something that reads a file and counts, well, calculates which, uh, which words are most used in a file. And Knuth being a genius that he is, he wrote a really beautiful solution. He used a strange language called Pascal. Nobody probably remembers that language. And I'm joking, obviously. Uh, <laughs> And he implemented a lot of novel data structures. He documented the hell out of it. And he published 10 pages of, for the solution. Uh, the second step was for the ACM Journal to invite another computer scientist to give a critique of, of the work. And now just imagine how scary it would be for somebody to ask you to critique, to critique Donald Knuth's implementation. And, but there was one brave guy called Doug, Doug McIlroy who was famous for Unix shell. And he just replied with six lines of Unix shell, which is beautiful. <laughs> so 10 pages of Pascal versus six lines of Unix. And this is the reason why I love ranges, is that they allow us to think in a more functional way. Instead of thinking of all the things that we need to do step by step. We know what our input is, and we know what the output is. We just need to find a series of chain transformations to get from one to another. And everything should be done automatically for us. You can think about the chain of transformations as a moving conveyor belt. You put the input on the left-hand side, and pass through a chain of transformations, and you get a beautiful gift for, I don't know, Halloween. It was <laughs> Halloween it was recently. So yeah, you get a Halloween present at the end. And neither of these transformations actually care which transformation is before, which transformation is after. Each transformation just cares that it gets a valid input and it outputs the valid output, which is really neat. In C++, it will be a little bit longer than six lines. <laughs> but it, it still should be fairly readable. We start with eStream range, which is equivalent for in, input stream iterators. It will generate word by word by word. The next step, since we want to clean up those words, we can just convert everything to lowercase, which is exactly what Doug McKillary did with the shell script and we can ignore anything that, uh, that is not alphanumeric. After that, just remove all the empty strings. Now, the, uh, one thing to mention is that ranges support uh, calling member to, uh, pointer to member functions, which not all libraries uh, currently do. So when we finished with this, we need to sort. Now the problem is if we consider range to be something like a forward iterator list, we can't really sort it. We need random access data to be able to properly sort, so we can, we can convert the result to a vector, then we get a proper chunk of memory with all the values evaluated, and then we sort the hell out of them. After sorting, do exactly the same as Unix shell does, group by equality, and count all the occurrences for all of the words. Now we are going to have pairs which store a frequency, how many times a word is used, and 
said word. In the end, again, we just need to sort. Now the sorting is going to be ascending. So if we want to, to print out uh, the most common words, we just say reverse and take the first ten. And this is really cool about the ranges. Obviously, the solution is not as efficient as the Pascal solution, which had everything optimized inside. But it's significantly shorter. It's two, two and a half slides with really big font. So some things here can be optimized without losing the, uh, the beauty of the solution. But most of the time, you can be satisfied with this result as well. And at least until you actually realize that it's much slower than you need it to be, and then you can optimize the hell out of it. Now, the iterators have their own problems. Uh, they're really cool for processing collections. But just imagine the following. We have the input stream, and we said it's a collection. We could have a series of mouse events. Is that an input collection? Again, as input streams are, why, why shouldn't an uh, event stream be a collection? The problem with iterators and ranges is that when you try to access the value, you're blocking until that value is present. So if you're going to use ranges with input streams, you can count on your main thread to be blocked for the most part of your program. Now, the next step in abstraction is instead of using the iterators that can be dereferenced, which is something that is often called a pull operation because you're trying to get the value out of something, there is an alternative called a push. So instead of you asking for the value, just imagine you're the transformation and somebody yells at you. He says, I don't know, 42. And then your transformation is to, dedu to deduct 2 from front 42, and you just yell, OK, 40. So nobody asked you for the value. As soon as you got some data, you emit your result. And that's, that's something that I coined push iterators, although I have no idea whether this is an actual term that you, that's used by anybody else. So just think of push, uh, push iterators as a generalization of a normal function. No, a normal function gets a value and returns a value. In this case, you can get as many values as you want, and you can emit completely independently as many va values as you want. And all the communication between different functions in this case is asynchronous. So all the functions are completely separate from one another. It's not like a normal function in C++ where you get the result and immediately pass it as an argument. It can be asynchronous, it can, it can be synchronous as you wish. <clears throat> so yet again, the push iterator accepts values and emits new ones independently, possibly independently from the ones that it received. So we can have different types of push vectors. We can have sources which could be iterators that don't accept any value, but just emit, like politicians, right? <laughs> so just put a politician in front of the screen, and it starts. <laughs> the next sync, the sync is an iterator that just listens to the values and doesn't speak. That's like a pol policeman or something like that. So. <laughs> Uh, you're going to talk, and the policeman is just going to listen and nod. And obviously, you have the normal iterators, which is a normal transformation, something that both receives and sends values on. So before we uh, continue, pun intended, <laughs> uh, most of the, apart from sinks, all the iterators need to be able to send the values on. Only the sinks are the silent type. Everything else wants to send values. So we are going to create, an, a, let's say, a superclass just to save on typing, which will be called continuator base, because continuator means something that can call the continuation function. 
and continuation function should be fairly familiar term. I guess so. So when we want to call a continuation function, we can just have an image member function and call std invoke. Now the question is, what's std invoke? So in C++, we have a lot of things that behave like functions that have the normal call syntax, name, open parentheses, arguments, close parentheses. But some things don't, even though some things look like functions, like member pointers to member functions and pointers to member variables, they, they are kind of functions. You provide them in something and they return your value. The core language doesn't allow you to invoke them in the, with the same syntax of pointer to member function, open brackets, pointer to this, and everything else. So for that reason, uh, std invoke was added to the standard library. It can call normal functions, so function objects, and it can call uh, pointers to member variables and member functions. STD invoke has a little bit strange syntax, but it's useful in generic context. If you don't know what your continuation or what your predicate when you're writing an algorithm, function type will be, and you want to be as generic as possible, then use STD invoke. Otherwise, obviously, use the normal call, call syntax. So we can start with a simple source push iterator, and we can say, Okay, we want to be able to get, have a vector of values, and when our system starts, we want to emit those values one by one. It should be fairly trivial. Just go through with the range for loop through all the values and call emit, emit, emit. Before that, initialize, and after that, report that we don't have any more values. Now, we could have created infinite streams, which is often useful. But sometimes you actually want to know when something ends. For example, when you reach the end of the file or something else. In the case of uh, mouse events, it's not that useful to have the end, but let's say it's half-half. <laughs> so we have created this. We have an iterator, push iterator, that can emit values. The next step, if we have somebody to talk, we should have somebody to listen. Uh, yeah. And that would be a sync. Since all the continuate, uh, continuator base, uh, the classes that inherit from continuator base, use std invoke. That means that we can use any, anything that looks like a function to be a sync. OK? So we can connect our sources directly to any C++ function. And it will just work. Now, the slide that I skipped. What can be a source? Apart from previously mentioned, we have a fixed array of values or a stream of uh, mouse coordinates. We can also uh, use the same idea to implement a simple web service. So we have clients, and we collect all the messages that come from the client. And we pretend that the entity, let's call this a service iterator, produces those messages. So we don't care about the clients. We just care about the messages. So we can create a source that just emits those messages and handles the clients internally. OK? <clears throat> and the next step, since we have somebody to talk, somebody to listen, we should probably have the people who are in the middle and transforming the input values into the output values. So the first one would be something that simulates std transform or the transform range. It gets values of certain type, it has a transformation function, and it emits values of the destination type. And it's even simpler than, than the previous, uh, previous source that emit, emitted values. We just need to emit whatever is returned by invoking the transformation on the input value. Trivial? <laughs> Why not? So <clears throat> just imagine that it doesn't say std invoke. It says m transformation of value. 
as it invoke is just an ugly syntax to do the same with more generality. After have really? <laughs> okay, I need to speed up. Uh, okay, so after this, this guy, we can implement the filtering transformation. The filtering transformation emits a value only if it satisfies the predicate. Again, we are calling the predicate using std invoke. Now that we have all the nodes, we want to be able to chain them just with the same syntax as the ranges do. Okay? How can we do, do this, this thing? We can consider uh, an expression, let's say this transformation expression, to be an abstract syntax tree. And instead of evaluating it, we are going to use, obviously, expression templates. We are going to build the AST as a tree of types. And just when we get both a source and a sync, we are going to evaluate that abstract syntax tree. Now the question is, uh, why don't we evaluate anything before we have both a source and a sync? Uh, you know the story, uh, the, uh, the philosophical question, if a tree falls down in a forest and nobody's there to hear it, uh, does it make a sound? In our case, the answer is no. So if you have a politician and nobody wants to listen to him, he don't, doesn't need to talk, right? <laughs> that doesn't happen in real life, but in our case, it's an optimization. If there is nobody to listen to something, then we don't want any transformation ever to happen. So we have a, a few uh, cases. If we have two transformations chained, it's still just an expression. If we have a source and transform a source, it's just an expression that represents a new source, right? And the same for sync. The only time when we actually evaluate anything is when you connect both so some source and some sync. And this is done with some uh, type tagging. We can create for all of our push iterators, we can create a category. So for example, a source node tag, transformation node tag, and sync doesn't even need to, to have a tag. Now we can create the, operate, the pipe operator which works on all our nodes. But the problem is if you tried to do this, then it would work on all types, which is definitely not something that we want. We just want to be able to accept a proper node. We can use something called a detection idiom. In C++20, we are going to get concepts, and we, we will be able to do it in a much, much nicer way. We can check whether we have detected the nested type called node category inside of a type. If yes, it's a node. Otherwise, it's not. And I'm going <laughs> to speed, speed up even more. So when we want to create the operator, we can pretend and say, OK, F require. It's require clause for concepts. And we, are, we want to require that the left guy and the right guy are nodes. Okay. And then we can cover all the four cases that we previously mentioned. So the cool thing is that with a huge pipe uh, of chain transformations, you can easily implement different types of reactive streams from web services to UIs and everything else. The cool thing is that the pipe can handle both asynchronous transformations, so transformations that don't return a value, but for example, as the future of something. And the best part is that if iterators were abstract, ranges were even more abstract, and this is on the top level, everything that is handled by these guys below can be handled by this and something more. So the last block is called going postal. Uh, this is an expression, I think it means going crazy or something like that in English, but I really like the, the expression. So if we have our uh, conveyor belt, I said that none of the transformations care about transformations on the left or, or on the right. They're just alone in the world and they don't care about anybody else. So why would we need to actually have a conveyor belt we can just say, OK, there is a truck moving a value into our factory, and our factory just has a single transformation. 
then the result is sent via another truck to the next transformation in some other city. So the current abstraction, when we define the pipeline, we never said that it's in the same process. We never said that it's in the same thread or even on the same continent. So a simple, stupid example. Uh, we have a pipe uh, that defines, it calls ping on localhost and processes the output. So it converts to upper to uppercase and a lot of stupid things. And it, in the end, tries to extract uh, the milli number of milliseconds that took the ping to return. So this is the logic behind this is not really important. It's just a series of transformations from one input to an output. And they said it's not really important whether this executes in the same process. So we can get scissors and cut the pipeline in a few places and say, OK, we are going to perform transformation just in the first process. Then all the results are going to be transparently uh, can, uh, sent to a separate process. Then the, that second process will be uh, the results of the second process will be passed on to the third one. The third one, again, does something and returns the values to the first process. So we have a nice cycle of, of values being emitted and processed and everything else. And the next one is live demo. Since I'm not currently on my computer because <laughs> there were some technical difficulties, so people asked me to... Uh, <laughs> to do the presentation from another computer. Just, I'm trying, I'll try to explain what the demo should have looked like. <laughs> so, you would have four columns. In the first column, you would have the first process, which is called front-end. In the last column, you would have the second back-end. And in the middle, so far, nothing happens. This guy just emits values, but the middle parts of the pipeline are not yet executed, okay? So this guy prints out something, the second backend doesn't receive yet any data. <laughs> now just imagine that happening, right? So in the one of, in the, one of the middle columns, we can start the first backend, and all of a sudden, the whole pipeline is connected. The, fr the front end sends to the first backend, the first backend to the second backend, the backend sends to the, to the front end. And finally, the front end starts printing out the milliseconds that the pipeline calculated and prints out, prints out, prints out, prints out. Now, the cool thing about, the, about the, these bridges is that you also can define them not to be one-to-one, -one, but to fan out, to fan in, and everything else. And I mentioned we have four columns, <laughs> you remember. And one of the columns is still empty. You can just start backend one in the second column, and then the main front end sends the data to both first backends instances. They both send now fan in to the second backend, and the front end receives a pair of results for each of the messages that it sent. Okay? This would be really cool and completely useless to see on a screen output of the pink comment to uppercase, but at least I tried to explain it as uh, the best I could. So in the end, obviously, thanks to a lot of people, including my friends at KDE, a few professors, and спасибо Sergei Dvum and Tonam. Thanks. So my question is, uh, is there some kind of library that implements these, uh, these uh, like mechanics? Or, and uh, is it will be in C++, like uh, in the standard? And uh, the second question is like, uh, is reactive programming libraries that are currently uh, third-party reactive uh, 
realize, implement the same ideas? Something like that. So uh, the first question, are there any libraries that implement this? Uh, there are a few, and they all implement it in different ways. So one of the recent work that Eric Nibler did was to mix coroutines with his ranges library to allow his ranges to do something similar. Uh, the problem with a lot of different approaches is that I don't like them personally, <laughs> uh, because usually people tend to focus too much on threads and executors and everything else. For me, the main point here is not that I want to do multi-threaded programming. Everything, most of the things can properly asynchronously work in a single threaded application. For me, the main point is in the abstraction. And as, you, as soon as you tie yourself to threads and executors, you're not as abstract. But if you have the need to actually work with executors, then you might need a different library. Now, this library kind of works. It's not yet released. It's, uh, it's public. It's GPL. I'm not going to tell you the address <laughs> because it's not yet released. Uh, but some people managed to, to, to find it in, in some Git repositories. Uh, I don't expect something like this to end up in, in the standard, apart from possibly ranges with coroutines. And that was the second question, right? Thank you. I've seen a project of Vittorio Romeo is uh, with task-based design. It's uh, futures without uh, type erasure. It's something very similar to it. Uh, did you see it? And did you get any ideas from that talk? Uh, so the ideas for this thing uh, were born, I think, 10 years ago. So this was an, uh, a really evolving thing that I, I used I uh, spent a couple of conferences to talk about similar things just during the evolution. Uh, as far as the non-type erased uh, futures, I've seen a couple of posts, posts regarding those. I didn't see any videos. And usually they, they revolve around the same concept from functional programming, which is con called the continuation monad. And this is also some form of continuation monad. So the idea for continuations is a really old one from Haskell and maybe even earlier. Uh, but in C++, it became, let's say, popular maybe five years ago. And I didn't answer, uh, answer your question, but <laughs> I'm the guy with the mic, so I, can, I can't ignore your question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <coughs> Thank you for your talk. Uh, I'm curious about one thing. Code looks, uh, I would say, uh, simpler and uh, easier to read. Uh, but what about debugging? Uh, there's a question that I absolutely always get asked on all the conferences that I go to. <laughs> so uh, I usually answer it with a counter question. If you have a asynchronous application, for example, using Boost the SIO, is the code easy to debug? I would say no. And I'm curious because a friend of mine, he used to develop application using Rx Java and other things. Mm -hmm. And he told that it's not possible to debug it at all. Yeah. So in essence, it's completely equi equivalent because uh, the compiler, when you write these pipes, the compiler generates all the calls and callbacks just as if you use Boost SIO. So from that point of view, it's really difficult to debug. The thing that is easy to debug is that <clears throat> inside of the pipe, you can, the good thing about pipes is that you can just put uh, something that echoes all the messages. So you're not going to do the step-by-step -step debugging, which is imperative, and this is not imperative code. You're going to do data debugging. So if you're creating a chain of transformations, you shouldn't expect it to be able uh, to debug with a step-by-step -step debugger. But something that prints out the values or the types or whatever is generated, that would be much more suited for this. 
and that way to debug uh, something like this would be quite quite natural. I got. Thank you. Hi. Thanks for a great talk. Uh, my question is: uh, Does your library support um, any kind of parallel operations in the pipelines? And if so, how can you deal with um, uh, some of the standard libraries' containers are not uh, thread safe, for example? So, uh, the back idea of all the systems that deal re with reactive programming is that all the transformations are completely isolated to one another. So, you don't care about multi threading or anything else. The only synchronization that needs to happen is the message passing. And, you, and that's something that is thread safe. You should never write two transformations that, to, that try to access the same collection. So each of the vectors in your program is just accessed by a single thread and a single transformation. So it's avoiding the problem, not fixing the problem. But if you, if you properly design something, then my claim is, obviously, I'm, I, I'm not 100% right. My claim is that you don't need to share any data when you do something like this. And one thing more. <laughs> if you do share data, you will never be able to split into separate processes. So you're actually destroying your, your design. If there are no more questions, спасибо.